so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erlins Fernandez. I'm going to talk about our security analysis of a programmable smart home. Uh, this is joint work with Jayan Jung of Microsoft Research and my advisor, Atul Prakash, at the University of Michigan. So smart homes are at the forefront of the Internet of Everything revolution, and they promise benefits in security, safety, and energy efficiency. They consist of several uh, interconnected devices uh, like CO sensors, smart door locks, uh, and connected ovens that use different kinds of communication protocols. Smart homes also have applications that talk to all of these devices to realize uh, these promised benefits. And we are seeing an emergence of several programming frameworks that unify all of these uh, devices and protocols and support building these third-party apps. Uh, Google, Weave, and Brillo, and Apple HomeKit are some examples. Uh, and some of these also have budding app stores, like, for example, Samsung SmartThings has its own app store, and so does Amazon Alexa. So although there are promised benefits, there are also potential security risks. For example, Denning et al. outlined some of these threats, including uh, property damage and theft. Uh, the FTC also recently uh, has a report outlining some of these threats. Furthermore, uh, some of these are concrete. For example, the MyQ uh, garage controller can be turned into a surveillance tool. Attackers can sniff network link keys in the Zigbee network and join this home automation network. And we see many other reports uh, of devices and protocols being compromised. But all of this looks at these devices and protocols uh, in isolation. Uh, and this makes them device specific and makes them require proximity to the home. No prior research has looked uh, at the smart home as a platform or the apps that it enables. And this brings us to our central research question. Uh, in what ways are these emerging programmable uh, smart homes vulnerable to attacks and what do these attacks entail? It is crucial to answer this question since that answer will guide uh, research, um, uh, research into defenses uh, before these systems become commonplace. So we decided to perform a security analysis of smart things, and we did this for several reasons. First, uh, this is a relatively mature platform. It has over 500 apps, more than double its nearest competitor. It has support for over 100 types of devices. And perhaps more importantly, it shares design principles with other existing frameworks that are in more uh, nascent design stages. So for example, it supports uh, access control through its capability system, and it supports the popular trigger action programming paradigm uh, through its event system. So our uh, research methodology has three steps here. We, first, we examine the security from five perspectives by constructing test smart apps to exercise the SmartThings API. Then we couple that with an empirical analysis of uh, 499 uh, smart apps to determine how prevalent these security issues are. And finally, we build proof of concept attacks to show how security fails in practice. So here is a quick uh, overview of our results. Uh, our security analysis areas uh, include overprivilege, uh, event system security, integration safety, input sanitization, and access control on APIs. We found security design issues in all of these and most notably, like two types of automatic overprivilege, as well as a snoopable and spoofable event system. In terms of our analysis, we found that more than 40% of apps in our data set exhibit at least one type um, of overprivilege. And finally, our proof of concept attacks inject pin codes into door locks. Uh, they snoop on existing pin codes. They cause, uh, you know, disable vacation mode and cause fake fire alarms. So before I jump into the details, a uh, bit of a primer on smart things. So smart things consists of this hub that has several uh, radios like Wi-Fi and Z-Wave, which it uses to talk to end devices. And it also has a companion app, a smartphone companion app that serves as a user interface for the hub. And it also serves as a configuration and control channel. Now the most interesting piece is the smart things cloud platform. It's a proprietary system and it runs uh, uh, the bunch of the system logic. There are a couple of interesting things here. The first is this idea of a smart device. Uh, its job is to abstract away lower level details of these devices and present the whole, all of these devices as un uh, uniform entities to the rest of the system. The second piece are these smart apps or smart things apps. They are written in a dynamic scripting language called Groovy, and they run in this Groovy-based sandbox. This is third party application developer code. And smart apps and devices interact with each other through this capability system, which I'm going to explain in the subsequent slides. Smart apps can also expose HTTP 
uh, endpoints, and this allows like external third-party client integration. And finally, smart apps have access to the internet and SMS APIs so that they can communicate with the external world. So this capability system uh, serves two purposes in smart things. Uh, from a functionality perspective, it defines the set of uh, operations an untrusted app can invoke on a device. And from a security perspective, this untrusted app can only invoke an operation if it is covered by a capability it has for that device. So here in my example, Z-Wave Lock, uh, it exposes several capabilities like lock, lock codes, and battery. And these capabilities themselves are just uh, collections of commands and attributes. So for example, capability lock has the lock and unlock command um, and uh, the lock status attribute. Now, designing such a system uh, is difficult because it requires balancing several uh, competing needs. So in terms of usability, uh, it leans towards having simpler, coarser capabilities. Uh, in terms of uh, security, it leans towards having uh, granular capabilities in support of least privilege. And developers would argue for expressive functionality for ease of development. So smart apps gain these capabilities in much the same way that Android apps gain permissions. You just ask the user. So here we have an example app asking for capability.battery. And when that is executed, it should, you see the UI on the right here. And then when the user taps that button, the authorized button, uh, it results in this device enumeration process. And this causes the system to uh, list all of the devices that support uh, that requested capability. So here it's the smoke sensor and the lock. And then the user has the uh, choice of you know, authorizing these devices to the app. So now that we have some basic understanding, let me dive into the security issues. The first is overprivilege, and this concerns the way apps and devices interact through the capability system in terms of commands and attributes. So we found two types of overprivilege. The first we call uh, coarse-grained uh, capability overprivilege. Uh, so consider this example uh, app called AutoLock from the App Store that provides a feature of uh, automatically uh, locking your door locks after 9 p.m. So clearly this app only needs access to the lock operation, but due to the way granularity is set in SmartThings, it also gains access to this unlock operation. And this unlock operation is the overprivilege here. The second one, uh, is called Core Smart App Smart Device Binding over Privilege. So another example, this app is asking for capability.battery. Now, as I explained, multiple devices can implement a capability, and then due to device enumeration, you will see multiple choices. But assuming the user uh, selects like device one, then this app, in addition to gaining capability.battery, is going to gain access to all the other capabilities uh, that device supports. Now, both of these kinds of uh, overprivilege uh, are automatic and occur through no fault of the developer. And the negative aspect of all of this is that it increases the attack surface of the home uh, if this app is compromised or you know, if uh, uh, it is malicious. Our second security issue concerns uh, events, and this got to do with how smart apps and devices interact with each other through the event mechanism. So a smart app can issue the subscribe call and then specify an event name, uh, door.unlock, and specify a handler. And then when that event occurs, the system is going to invoke that handler with some event data. We found three uh, design issues with this setup. The first is that once this smart app gains access to any of the capabilities uh, of that device, it can subscribe to any and all uh, events that device generates. Second, if the smart app gains this 128-bit device identifier, uh, then it can monitor all of the events of that device without gaining any of the capabilities supported by that device. This is a form of privilege escalation, and the paper has some details on how a device, uh, an app may gain this ID. Finally, again, using the 128-bit ID, uh, apps can spoof physical device uh, events and impersonate physical devices. So the upshot of all of this is that it can lead uh, to leakage of confidential information and that apps and devices can take incorrect actions based on spoofed events. So next up is uh, the OAuth vulnerabilities. So OAuth has been explored in the past in the context of mobile applications most recently. Um, and it was shown that you know, there are several kinds of remote attacks possible if you incorrectly implement this protocol. Uh, SmartThings is no different in this regard. It uses OAuth 2.0. The next one is called uh, what we call Groovy uh, command injection attacks. So smart apps are written in this language called Groovy. 
uh, and they offer this feature of dynamic method invocation. So consider this example. Uh, there's a function foo, and then there's a string variable initialized to the characters f, o, o. Now, a programmer can specify a dollar sign uh, and then the name of the string variable, and then Groovy at runtime is going to evaluate that string and call the function foo. Now, if this string comes from untrusted locations, such as the network, then attackers can basically inject uh, unintended commands into this app. And finally, we found that smart apps do not request any capabilities, do not need to request any capabilities uh, to gain access to the SMS and internet APIs. And this can lead to arbitrary data leakage. So we decided to you know, focus on the overprivilege issue and see how prevalent it is, because it is what makes apps uh, a target for exploitation. But to do that measurement, we need a definition of overprivilege. And so here, each uh, circle is an app. And ideally, we would want an app to use all of its commands and attributes and to use all of its capabilities. But if it happens that uh, an app uses only a subset of its requested uh, commands and attributes and does not use all of its granted capabilities, then it uh, exhibits uh, coarse grain capability over privilege um, and coarse smart app smart device binding over privilege. But before we can do this measurement, we had to overcome several challenges. The first is that this whole capability documentation was incomplete um, and we had to complete it. So the way forward was to look at the network traces between the SmartThings web app um, and the backend. Uh, and then this led us to a set of uh, REST endpoints that helped us complete the com capability documentation. Next, the SmartThings system is closed source, and this rules out instrumentation-based approaches uh, where you look at the APIs being invoked dynamically. Instead, we were able to obtain a data set of uh, 499 apps in source form and do the analysis on them instead. Uh, finally, Groovy is very dynamic, and this rules out static and existing tools like Suit. Instead, we built uh, our own uh, tool that looks at the AST of the program. So after overcoming these challenges, we achieved our measurement goals. And in terms of capability documentation, we observed uh, 93 uh, commands as opposed to the document at 65, and 85 attributes as opposed to the document at 60. In terms of overprivilege, 276 apps exhibit coarse grain capability overprivilege. Uh, and 213 ex uh, exhibit course binding over privilege. Worryingly, we found that uh, 68 or 14 percent of the data set uh, actually um, you, there are apps that provide uh, legitimate functionality uh, based on this overprivilege. And this is dangerous because it can lock smart things into providing overprivilege as a feature rather than getting rid of it. So, how does all of this lead to security failures? So we built four proof of concept attacks that compose several attack vectors to show you how this can happen. In the first attack, uh, it combines command injection and OAuth compromise and overprivilege to inject a pin code into a connected door lock. This leverages an existing popular uh, smart app that exposes an HTTP endpoint for its Android companion app. And this app only offers the feature of locking and unlocking the door lock. You cannot do anything else. Um, but after compromising OAuth, the details of which are in the paper, uh, attackers can send a set code message uh, to this app and then basically have that app program a pin code. And this message is accepted for two reasons. First, it uses an unfiltered Groovy string. And second, we know uh, that it suffers from automatic overprivilege. So we make it do the unintended action of programming the door lock for us. Uh, the next one leverages overprivilege and the unrestricted SMS API to snoop on pin codes as they are created um, and then leak that information out. Uh, this, uh, the, we, we built a stealthy malware app that looks benign even at the source code level. And more interestingly, this app only requests the ability to monitor battery levels of devices around the home. The last two attacks uh, uh, use the event spoofing uh, vulnerability. Uh, and the first one, disabling vacation mode, constructs an event to disrupt the execution of a vacation mode app, thereby disabling vacation mode for the home. And the fake CEO alarm attack is another malware app um, that creates an event to impersonate a CEO sensor and then cause a fake fire alarm. Both of these attacks do not require any capabilities. So what can we do to better design such systems? We have two suggestions. First is to think about achieving least privilege. And it is important to recognize that there is an inherent risk asymmetry in device operations. So oven.on is a fire hazard, but oven.off is just uncooked food. 
uh, smart things. Currently, you know, there's a functional grouping, but uh, it might be good to consider notions of risk from stakeholders using the methodology of felt et al., and then produce uh, risk-based capabilities. Finally, system designers should uh, uh, consider, should exercise caution when creating and distributing these events. And a way forward would be to have a notion of uh, strong identity uh, and couple that with access control on these events. So in summary, uh, our work offers the first comprehensive look at one of these programmable platforms. This was challenging to do because Samsung SmartThings is a black box uh, proprietary system. Overcoming these challenges, we found you know, several security issues. Uh, the most important would be the two types of automatic overprivilege and the insecure event system design. Our empirical analysis found that 55% of apps uh, do not use all the operations their capabilities imply, and 43% get capabilities they did not ask for. We built four proof of concept attacks that compose various attack vectors, um, and these attacks are uh, device independent and long range. And finally, our work has already led to security improvements. Uh, we notified SmartThings in December 2015, and in April, we were notified that they have updated their vetting processes to explicitly look for the kinds of attacks we introduce. They also updated their best practices to discourage unfiltered strings. And more recently, uh, we have been having discussions on how to improve this capability system design. Uh, the website has source code and some demo videos. Thank you for your attention. We have time for a few questions. Okay, I'll lead with one. Uh, so um, <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, you, know, uh, you can build an app that looks uh, uh, innocuous even at the source code level. Uh, uh, what is it that allows you to do that and still be able to sort of leverage the unrestricted SMS API and it's it's so you can do the pin sp uh, snooping? Yeah, so it's that, uh, that uh, groovy dynamic method invocation. So the idea is that you basically make the code look syntactically similar to a battery monitoring app, but then at runtime, you just send a bunch of strings to reconfigure the app to actually start listening to uh, door lock pin codes as opposed to you know, uh, monitoring the battery levels. And you can like, switch between these two at runtime. Uh, Rob Cunningham, MIT Lincoln Lab. So that was great work. And I'm totally frightened of having any kind of a smart house in the future. <laughs> My question has to do with, um, th there's, this is just one of several different systems that are being uh, promoted by various uh, companies. Have you had a chance to look across some of the others? Do you see differences in the design that might lead to a better um, smart home, so to speak? Yeah, so we did look at several of the systems that I mentioned in the first part of the talk. Um, and the reason we focus on smart things is because they actually share uh, design principles between, so there are commonalities. Um, and that's why we think you know, the results of this research could be actually applied to those systems and improve them. And they are like in more nascent design stages. Um, so yeah, we did look at them and you know, they're representative. This is representative. I'd be curious what you uh, would think um, would be um, other areas to investigate. I mean, overprivilege seems like, you know, it's a problem, but it's not the, the worst one. Uh, what, what other things are scary? Yeah, so this whole event system, right, so like the whole idea of trigger action is actually very, it fits very naturally to this whole IoT environment. I mean, there was a paper at Kai that basically discussed that, they did a use study and they said that uh, they showed that um, you know, this whole trigger action thing is, is, is a very natural way of programming. So, and then the flaws we found with this event system that supports uh, the trigger action thing, I think that is a very interesting uh, design flaw and something worth fixing uh, beyond overprivilege. Sorry? Oh, you mean between devices? Oh yeah, so I mean that sort of goes down the line of intrusion detection and you know detecting malware apps that may be already on the system. Um, so, but yeah, that is also a very interesting area, and we are actually looking at some of some of those problems there. <laughs>